Orphans of the Sky, written by Robert A. Heinlein. Part 1. Universe. The Proxima Centauri Expedition, sponsored by the Jordan Foundation in 2119, was the first recorded attempt to reach the nearer stars of this galaxy. Whatever its unhappy fate, we can only conjecture. Quoted from The Romance of Modern Astrography by Franklin Buck. Published by Lux Transcriptions Limited, 3.50 CR. There's a muty! Look out! At the shouted warning, Hugh Hoyland ducked, with nothing to spare. An egg-sized iron missile clanged against the bulkhead just above his scalp with force that promised a fractured skull. The speed with which he crouched had lifted his feet from the floor plates. Before his body could settle slowly to the deck, he planted his feet against the bulkhead behind him and shoved. He went shooting down the passageway in a long, flat dive, his knife drawn and ready. He twisted in the air, checked himself with his feet against the opposite bulkhead at the turn in the passage from which the mutie had attacked him, and floated lightly to his feet. The other branch of the passage was empty. His two companions joined him, sliding awkwardly across the floor plates. Is it gone? demanded Alan Mahoney. Yes, agreed Hoyland. I caught a glimpse of it as it ducked down that hatch. A female, I think. Looked like it had four legs. Two legs or four. We'll never catch it now, commented the third man. Who the huff wants to catch it? protested Mahoney. I don't. Well, I do, for one said Hoyland. By Jordan, if its aim had been two inches better, I'd be ready for the converter. Can't either one of you two speak three words without swearing? The third man disapproved. What if the captain could hear you? He touched his forehead reverently as he mentioned the captain. Oh, for Jordan's sake, snapped Hoyland. Don't be so stuffy, Mort Tyler. You're not a scientist yet. I reckon I'm as devout as you are. There's no grave sin in occasionally giving vent to your feelings. Even the scientists do it. I've heard them. Tyler opened his mouth as if to expostulate, then apparently thought better of it. Mahoney touched Hoyland on the arm. Look, Hugh, he pleaded. Let's get out of here. We've never been this high before. I'm jumpy. I want to get back down to where I can feel some weight on my feet. Hoyland looked longingly toward the hatch through which his assailant had disappeared while his hand rested on the grip of his knife. Then he turned to Mahoney. Okay, kid, he agreed. It's a long trip down anyhow. He turned and slithered back toward the hatch, whereby they had reached the level where they now were, the other two following him. Disregarding the ladder by which they had mounted, he stepped off into the opening and floated slowly down to the deck fifteen feet below, Tyler and Mahoney close behind him. Another hatch, staggered a few feet from the first, gave access to a still lower deck. Down, 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 and still farther down they dropped. Tens and dozens of decks, each silent, dimly lighted, mysterious. Each time they fell a little faster, landed a little harder. Mahoney protested at last. Let's walk the rest of the way, Hugh. That last jump hurt my feet. All right, but it will take longer. How far have we got to go? Anybody keep count? We've got about seventy decks to go to reach farm country, answered Tyler. How do you know? demanded Mahoney suspiciously. I counted them, stupid, and as we came down I took one away for each deck. You did not! Nobody but a scientist can do numbering like that. Just because you're learning to read and write, you think you know everything. Hoyland cut in before it could develop into a quarrel. Shut up, Alan. Maybe he can do it. He's clever about such things. Anyhow, it feels like about seventy decks. I'm heavy enough. Maybe he'd like to count the blades on my knife. Stow it, I said. Dueling is forbidden outside the village. That is the rule. They proceeded in silence, running lightly down the stairways until increasing weight on each succeeding level forced them to a more pedestrian pace. Presently, they broke through into a level that was quite brilliantly lighted and more than twice as deep between decks as the ones above it. The air was moist and warm, 
Vegetation obscured the view. Well, down at last, said Hugh. I don't recognize this farm. We must have come down by a different line than we went up. There's a farmer, said Tyler. He put his little fingers to his lips and whistled, then called, Hey, shipmate, where are we? The peasant looked them over slowly, then directed them in reluctant monosyllables to the main passageway which would lead them back to their own village. A brisk walk of a mile and a half down a wide tunnel moderately crowded with traffic. Travelers, porters, an occasional pushcart. A dignified scientist swinging in a litter borne by four husky orderlies and preceded by his master-at-arms to clear the common crew out of the way. A mile and a half of this brought them to the common of their own village, a spacious compartment three decks high and perhaps ten times as wide. They split up and went their own ways, Hugh to his quarters in the barracks of the cadets, young bachelors who did not live with their parents. He washed himself and went thence to the compartments of his uncle, for whom he worked for his meals. His aunt glanced up as he came in, but said nothing, as became a woman. His uncle said, Hello, Hugh. Been exploring again? Good eating, uncle. Yes. His uncle, a stolid, sensible man, looked tolerantly amused. Where did you go and what did you find? Hugh's aunt had slipped silently out of the compartment and now returned with his supper which she placed before him. He fell too. It did not occur to him to thank her. He munched a bite before replying. Up. We climbed almost to the level of no weight. A mutie tried to crack my skull. His uncle chuckled. You'll find your death in those passageways, lad. Better you should pay more attention to my business against the day when I'll die and get out of your way. Hugh looked stubborn. Don't you have any curiosity, uncle? Me? Oh, I was prying enough when I was a lad. I followed the main passage all the way around and back to the village. Right through the dark sector I went, with muties tagging my heels. See that scar? Hugh glanced at it perfunctorily. He had seen it many times before, and heard the story repeated to boredom. Once around the ship, phooey. He wanted to go everywhere, see everything, and find out the why of things. Those upper levels now. If men were not intended to climb that high, why had Jordan created them? But he kept his own counsel and went on with his meal. His uncle changed the subject. I've occasion to visit the witness. John Black claims I owe him three swine. Want to come along? Why, no, I guess not. Wait, I believe I will. Hurry up, then. They stopped at the cadet's barracks, Hugh claiming an errand. The witness lived in a small, smelly compartment directly across the common from the barracks, where he would be readily accessible to any who had need of his talents. They found him sitting in his doorway, picking his teeth with a fingernail. His apprentice, a pimply-faced adolescent with an intent, nearsighted expression, squatted behind him. Good eating, said Hugh's uncle. Good eating to you, Eddard Hoyland. Do you come on business, or to keep an old man company? Both, Hugh's uncle returned diplomatically, then explained his errand. So, said the witness, well, the contract's clear enough. Black John delivered ten bushels of oats, expecting his pay in a pair of shoats. Ed brought his sow to breed for pig. John gets his pay when the pigs grow big. How big are the pigs now, Eddard Hoyland? Big enough, acknowledged Hugh's uncle. But Black claims three instead of two. Tell him to go soak his head. The witness has spoken. He laughed in a thin, high cackle. The two gossiped for a few minutes, Eddard Hoyland digging into his recent experiences to satisfy the old man's insatiable liking for details. Hugh kept decently silent while the older men talked, but when his uncle turned to go, he spoke up. I'll stay a while, uncle. Yeah? Suit yourself. Good eating, witness. Good eating, Eddard Hoyland. 
I've brought you a present, witness, said Hugh, when his uncle had passed out of hearing. Let me see it. Hugh produced a package of tobacco, which he had picked up from his locker at the barracks. The witness accepted it without acknowledgement, then tossed it to his apprentice, who took charge of it. Come inside, invited the witness, then directed his speech to his apprentice. Here, you, fetch the cadet a chair. Now, lad, he added as they sat themselves down, tell me what you have been doing with yourself. Hugh told him, and was required to repeat in detail all the incidents of his more recent explorations, the witness complaining the meanwhile over his inability to remember exactly everything he saw. You youngsters have no capacity, he pronounced. No capacity, even that lout. He jerked his head toward the apprentice. He has none, though he's a dozen times better than you. Would you believe it, he can't soak up a thousand lines a day, yet he expects to sit in my seat when I am gone. Why, when I was apprenticed, I used to sing myself to sleep on a mere thousand lines. Leaky vessels, that's what you are. Hugh did not dispute the charge, but waited for the old man to go on, which he did in his own time. You had a question to put to me, lad. In a way, witness. Well, out with it. Don't chew your tongue. Did you ever climb all the way up to no weight? Me? Of course not. I was a witness, learning my calling. I had the lines of all the witnesses before me to learn, and no time for boyish amusements. I had hoped you could tell me what I would find there. Well, now, that's another matter. I've never climbed, but I hold the memories of more climbers than you will ever see. I'm an old man. I knew your father's father and his grandsire before that. What is it you want to know? Well, what was it he wanted to know? How could he ask a question that was no more than a gnawing ache in his breast? Still... What is it all for, witness? Why are there all those levels above us? Eh? How's that? Jordan's name, son. I'm a witness, not a scientist. Well, I thought you must know. I'm sorry. But I do know. What you want is the lines from the beginning. I've heard them. Hear them again. All your answers are in there if you've the wisdom to see them. Attend me. No, this is a chance for my apprentice to show off his learning. Hear you, the lines from the beginning, and mind your rhythm. The apprentice wet his lips with his tongue and began. In the beginning there was Jordan, thinking his lonely thoughts alone. In the beginning there was darkness, formless, dead, and man unknown, out of the loneness came a longing, out of the longing came a vision, out of the dream there came a planning, out of the plan there came decision. Jordan's hand was lifted and the ship was born. Mile after mile of snug compartments, tank by tank for the golden corn, ladder and passage, door and locker, fit for the needs of the yet unborn. He looked on his work and found it pleasing, meet for a race that was yet to be. He thought of man, man came into being, checked his thought and searched for the key. Man untamed would shame his maker, man unruled would spoil the plan. So Jordan made the regulations, orders to each single man each to a task and each to a station, serving a purpose beyond their ken. Some to speak and some to listen, order came to the ranks of men. Crew he created to work at their stations, scientists to guide the plan. Over them all he created the captain, made him judge of the race of man. Thus it was in the golden age. 
Jordan is perfect, all below him lack perfection in their deeds. Envy, greed, and pride of spirit sought for mines to lodge their seeds. One there was who gave them lodging, a cursed huff, the first to sin. His evil counsel stirred rebellion, planted doubt where it had not been. Blood of martyrs stained the floor plates. Jordan's captain made the trip. Darkness swallowed up. The old man gave the boy the back of his hand, sharp across the mouth. Try again. From the beginning? No, from where you missed. The boy hesitated, then caught his stride. Darkness swallowed ways of virtue. Sin prevailed throughout the ship. The boy's voice droned on, stanza after stanza, reciting at great length, but with little sharpness of detail, the old, old story of sin, rebellion, and the time of darkness. How wisdom prevailed at last, and the bodies of the rebel leaders were fed to the converter. How some of the rebels escaped making the trip, and lived to father the muties. How a new captain was chosen after prayer and sacrifice. Hugh stirred uneasily, shuffling his feet. No doubt the answers to his questions were there, since these were the sacred lines, but he had not the wit to understand them. Why? What was it all about? Was there really nothing more to life than eating and sleeping, and finally the long trip? Didn't Jordan intend for him to understand? Then why this ache in his breast, this hunger that persisted in spite of good eating? While he was breaking his fast after sleep, an orderly came to the door of his uncle's compartments. The scientist requires the presence of Hugh Hoyland, he recited glibly. Hugh knew that the scientist referred to was Lieutenant Nelson in charge of the spiritual and physical welfare of the ship's sector which included Hugh's native village. He bolted the last of his breakfast and hurried after the messenger. Cadet Hoyland, he was announced. The scientist looked up from his own meal and said, Oh, yes, come in, my boy, sit down. Have you eaten? Hugh acknowledged that he had, but his eyes rested with interest on the fancy fruit in front of his superior. Nelson followed his glance. Try some of these figs. They're a new mutation. I had them brought all the way from the far side. Go ahead. A man your age always has somewhere to stow a few more bites. Hugh accepted with much self-consciousness. Never before had he eaten in the presence of a scientist. The elder leaned back in his chair, wiped his fingers on his shirt, arranged his beard, and started in. I haven't seen you lately, son. Tell me what you have been doing with yourself. Before Hugh could reply, he went on. No, don't tell me. I will tell you. For one thing, you have been exploring, climbing, without too much respect for the forbidden areas. Is it not so? He held the young man's eye. Hugh fumbled for a reply. But he was let off again. Never mind. I know. And you know that I know. I am not too displeased, but it has brought it forcibly to my attention that it is time that you decided what you are to do with your life. Have you any plans? Well, no definite ones, sir. How about that girl, Edris Baxter? Do you intend to marry her? Why, uh, I don't know, sir. I guess I want to, and her father is willing, I think. Only... Only what? Well, he wants me to apprentice to his farm. I suppose it's a good idea. His farm, together with my uncle's business, would make a good property. But you're not sure. Well, I don't know. Correct. You're not for that. I have other plans. Tell me, have you ever wondered why I taught you to read and write? Of course you have. But you've kept your own counsel. That is good. 
Now attend me. I've watched you since you were a small child. You have more imagination than the common run, more curiosity, more go, and you are a born leader. You were different even as a baby. Your head was too large for one thing, and there were some who voted at your birth inspection to put you at once into the converter, but I held them off. I wanted to see how you would turn out. A peasant life is not for the likes of you. You are to be a scientist. The old man paused and studied his face. Hugh was confused, speechless. Nelson went on. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. For a man of your temperament, there are only two things to do with him. Make him one of the custodians or send him to the converter. Do you mean, sir, that I have nothing to say about it? If you want to put it that bluntly, yes. To leave the bright ones among the ranks of the crew is to breed heresy. We can't have that. We had it once, and it almost destroyed the human race. You have marked yourself out by your exceptional ability. You must now be instructed in right thinking, be initiated into the mysteries, in order that you may be a conserving force rather than a focus of infection and a source of trouble. The orderly reappeared, loaded down with bundles which he dumped on the deck. Hugh glanced at them, then burst out. Why, those are my things. Certainly, acknowledged Nelson. I sent for them. You're to sleep here, henceforth. I'll see you later and start you on your studies, unless you have something more on your mind. Why, no, sir, I guess not. I must admit I am a little confused. I suppose, I suppose this means you don't want me to marry? Oh, that, Nelson answered indifferently. Take her if you like. Her father can't protest now. But let me warn you, you'll grow tired of her. Hugh Hoyland devoured the ancient books that his mentor permitted him to read and felt no desire for many, many sleeps to go climbing or even to stir out of Nelson's cabin. More than once, he felt that he was on the track of the secret, a secret as yet undefined, even as a question. But again, he would find himself more confused than ever. It was evidently harder to reach the wisdom of scientisthood than he had thought. Once, while he was worrying away at the curious, twisted characters of the ancients and trying to puzzle out their odd rhetoric and unfamiliar terms, Nelson came into the little compartment that had been set aside for him, and, laying a fatherly hand on his shoulder, asked, How goes it, boy? Why, well enough, sir, I suppose, he answered, laying the book aside. Some of it is not quite clear to me, not clear at all, to tell the truth. That is to be expected, the old man said equably. I've let you struggle along by yourself at first in order that you may see the traps that native wit alone will fall into. Many of these things are not to be understood without instruction. What have you there? He picked up the book and glanced at it. It was inscribed, Basic Modern Physics. So, this is one of the most valuable of the sacred writings, yet the uninitiate could not possibly make good use of it without help. The first thing that you must understand, my boy, is that our forefathers, for all their spiritual perfection, did not look at things in the fashion in which we do. They were incurable romantics rather than rationalists as we are, and the truths which they handed down to us, though strictly true, were frequently clothed in allegorical language. For example, have you come to the law of gravitation? I read about it. Did you understand it? No, I can see that you didn't. Well, said Hugh defensively, it didn't seem to mean anything. It just sounded silly, if you will pardon me, sir. That illustrates my point. You were thinking of it in literal terms, like the laws governing electrical devices found elsewhere in this same book. Two bodies attract each other directly as the product of their masses and inversely as the square of their distance. It sounds like a rule for simple physical facts, does it not? 
Yet it is nothing of the sort. It was the poetical way the old ones had of expressing the rule of propinquity which governs the emotion of love. The bodies referred to are human bodies. Mass is their capacity for love. Young people have a greater capacity for love than the elderly. When they are thrown together, they fall in love. Yet when they are separated, they soon get over it. Out of sight, out of mind. It's as simple as that. But you were seeking some deep meaning for it. Hugh grinned. I never thought of looking at it that way. I can see that I am going to need a lot of help. Is there anything else bothering you just now? Well, yes, lots of things, though I probably can't remember them offhand. I mind one thing. Tell me, Father, can muties be considered as being people? I can see you have been listening to idle talk. The answer to that is both yes and no. It is true that the muties originally descended from people, but they are no longer part of the crew. They cannot now be considered as members of the human race, for they have flouted Jordan's law. This is a broad subject, he went on, settling down to it. There is even some question as to the original meaning of the word mutie. Certainly they number among their ancestors the mutineers who escaped death at the time of the rebellion, but they also have in their blood the blood of many of the mutants who were born during the Dark Age. You understand, of course, that during that period our present wise rule of inspecting each infant for the mark of sin and returning to the converter any who are found to be mutations was not in force. There are strange and horrible things crawling through the dark passageways and lurking in the deserted levels. Hugh thought about it for a while, then asked, Why is it that mutations still show up among us, the people? That is simple. The seed of sin is still in us. From time to time it still shows up, incarnate. In destroying those monsters, we help to cleanse the stock and thereby bring closer the culmination of Jordan's plan, the end of the trip at our heavenly home, Far Centaurus. Hoyland's brow wrinkled again. That is another thing that I don't understand. Many of these ancient writings speak of the trip as if it were an actual moving, a going somewhere, as if the ship itself were no more than a pushcart. How can that be? Nelson chuckled. How can it indeed? How can that move which is the background against which all else moves? The answer, of course, is plain. You have again mistaken allegorical language for the ordinary usage of everyday speech. Of course, the ship is solid, immovable, in a physical sense. How can the whole universe move? Yet it does move in a spiritual sense. With every righteous act, we move closer to the sublime destination of Jordan's plan. Hugh nodded. I think I see. Of course, it is conceivable that Jordan could have fashioned the world in some other shape than the ship had it suited his purpose. When man was younger and more poetical, holy men vied with one another in inventing fanciful worlds which Jordan might have created. One school invented an entire mythology of a topsy-turvy world of endless reaches of space, empty save for pinpoints of light and bodiless mythological monsters. They called it the heavenly world, or heaven, as if to contrast it with the solid reality of the ship. They seemed never to tire of speculating about it, inventing details for it, and of making pictures of what they conceived it to be like. I suppose they did it to the greater glory of Jordan, and who is to say that he found their dreams unacceptable? But in this modern age, we have more serious work to do. Hugh was not interested in astronomy. Even his untutored mind had been able to see in its wild extravagance an intention not literal. He turned to problems nearer at hand. Since the muties are the seed of sin, why do we make no effort to wipe them out? Would not that be an act that would speed the plan? The old man considered a while before replying. 
That is a fair question, and deserves a straight answer. Since you are to be a scientist, you will need to know the answer. Look at it this way. There is a definite limit to the number of crew the ship can support. If our numbers increase without limit, there comes a time when there will not be good eating for all of us. Is it not better that some should die in brushes with the muties than that we should grow in numbers until we killed each other for food? The ways of Jordan are inscrutable. Even the muties have a part in his plan. It seemed reasonable, but Hugh was not sure. But when Hugh was transferred to active work as a junior scientist in the operation of the ship's functions, he found there were other opinions. As was customary, he put in a period serving the converter. The work was not onerous. He had principally to check in the waste materials brought in by porters from each of the villages, keep books of their contributions, and make sure that no reclaimable metal was introduced into the first stage hopper. But it brought him into contact with Bill Ertz, the assistant chief engineer, a man not much older than himself. He discussed with him the things he had learned from Nelson, and was shocked at Ertz's attitude. Get this through your head, kid, Ertz told him. This is a practical job for practical men. Forget all that romantic nonsense, Jordan's plan. That stuff is all right to keep the peasants quiet and in their place, but don't fall for it yourself. There is no plan, other than our own plans for looking out for ourselves. The ship has to have light and heat and power for cooking and irrigation. The crew can't get along without those things, and that makes us boss of the crew. As for this soft-headed tolerance toward the muties, you're going to see some changes made. Keep your mouth shut and string along with us. It impressed on him that he was expected to maintain a primary loyalty to the block of younger men among the scientists. They were a well-knit organization within an organization, and were made up of practical, hard-headed men who were working toward improvement of conditions throughout the ship as they saw them. They were well-knit because an apprentice who failed to see things their way did not last long. Either he failed to measure up and soon found himself back in the ranks of the peasants, or, as was more likely, suffered some mishap and wound up in the converter and Hoyland began to see that they were right. They were realists. The ship was the ship. It was a fact, requiring no explanation. As for Jordan, who had ever seen him, spoken to him? What was this nebulous plan of his? The object of life was living. A man was born, lived his life, and then went to the converter. It was as simple as that, no mystery to it no sublime trip, and no Centaurus. These romantic stories were simply hangovers from the childhood of the race before men gained the understanding and the courage to look facts in the face. He ceased bothering his head about astronomy and mystical physics and all the other mass of mythology he had been taught to revere. He was still amused, more or less, by the lines from the beginning and by all the old stories about Earth what the huff was earth, anyhow, but now realized that such things could be taken seriously only by children and dullards. Besides, there was work to do. The younger men, while still maintaining the nominal authority of their elders, had plans of their own, the first of which was a systematic extermination of the muties. Beyond that, their intentions were still fluid but they contemplated making full use of the resources of the ship, including the upper levels. The young men were able to move ahead with their plans without an open breach with their elders, because the older scientists simply did not bother to any great extent with the routine of the ship. The present captain had grown so fat that he rarely stirred from his cabin. His aide, one of the young men's block, attended to affairs for him. Hoyland never laid eyes on the chief engineer save once when he showed up for the purely religious ceremony of manning landing stations. The project of cleaning out the muties required reconnaissance of the upper levels to be done systematically. It was in carrying out such scouting that Hugh Hoyland was again ambushed by a mutie. 
This mutie was more accurate with his slingshot. Hoyland's companions, forced to retreat by superior numbers, left him for dead.